we were worshiping this morning, the Lord just kind of gave Hardy this image, and, and it was of Jesus on the outside of a door, and he was knocking at this door, and the door was shut, and whoever was on the other side wasn't opening it, and Jesus just began to weep. And the sense we have from the Spirit is that, there, that Christ wants to come into our lives, and some of us are keeping him out. So open the door. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. And it's just what a gift to be able to gather together as the body of Christ and to have the Holy Spirit just speak to all of us, speak through us in different ways, and, and just uh, God to share uh, encouraging words through each other. And so, Father, we just thank you for the gift of your presence. For the gift of you, Father, we, as we looked at Christmas morning, the, your gift of yourself to the world. And that, Lord, you also gave the gift of your Holy Spirit to be with us. Lord, you've never left us alone. You've never abandoned us. And so, Father, we just thank you that you are with us. Open the eyes and ears of our hearts to receive from you this morning all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's a new year. And so, amen. Yeah, some of you, uh, feel free to clap. Some of you are like, I liked 2022, but... It's had some challenges. Uh, a new year is a symbol for many people as an opportunity for a fresh start. We have New Year's resolutions to be healthier. Uh, the, everyone who's already in the gym starts joking that uh, tomorrow they're going to see a bunch of people they've never seen before in their lives at the gym. Uh, we start doing New Year's resolutions to accomplish goals, to quit or change unhealthy habits, and on and on. And for many people, unfortunately... Somewhere along the way, we forget, lose sight of, or give up on the goals that we've set at the beginning of a year. Has anyone ever had that happen? A few times, more than we want to admit. Um, and then what happens a lot of times, we're like, well, I'll decide to try again next year. But here's, here's a fun little side note uh, before we get into our big idea this morning is this. Every day is exactly one year from the same day last year, right? So every day is a new opportunity to start again. Every single day is new in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's keep that in mind going into this. There's maybe a new year on the calendar, but God makes every day new. His mercies are new every morning. He makes us new every day. In every moment Every second, the second we turn to him, the second we open that door to Christ, in that very moment, we are no longer as we were that half a second before. We are new. So remember that this morning. Amen. So how many of us have felt at least once in our lives, or maybe often, that we needed to start over? especially when it comes to our, our spiritual life and, and walking and following Jesus. And the reality is, uh, sometimes we think of that picture of someone who's Jesus knocking on the door, someone who's never, ever accepted Christ in their life. But the reality is that every single day, God wants to dwell with us. Every single day, God is wanting to lead us into what he has for us. Every single day, Christ is knocking on our hearts saying, will you follow me? Will you follow me? And sometimes in our lives, and um, if you're imperfect like me, there's moments where in following Christ, you trip up and you fall. You get scuffed up or you get a little disoriented and you're stuck spinning around like, where'd you go, Jesus? And he's like, I'm right here. Where did you go? Or there's moments where we think we're following Jesus and we're like, but we're just looking at the road. We're not really looking at him. And all of a sudden, the things in life happen, and there's a fork in the road. And we, we think we're following Jesus, but then we look up and realize he's going that way, and we were going this way. And so there's times in our lives that we wake up and we realize we need to kind of have that fresh start. We sing about that fresh outpouring of daily needing newness in Christ. And I want us to get a hold of that every day, every moment that we are with him. He makes us new. But we need to be with him. We need to be in him and allow him, invite him in to us. See, throughout the Bible, we see the analogy of our lives being like a journey or, or a race. 
this journey that we're going. And I love Apostle Paul's uh, narratives or symbols often of this journey and this race. Our lives, we, we learn that in and through Christ, our lives have direction, a calling, a destination, a purpose. If you are in Christ, Christ is in you, your life has been redeemed out of the aimlessness, out of the chaos, out of the darkness of this world, and God has given us a purpose. Because we have him, God created everything and it is good. And so if the creator of the universe is within us, he is always at work, always making things new. We are a part of his plan. We are a part of what God is doing in this world around us. But we can so easily in our current world and context become easily distracted or redirected. And we wander off course, we get discouraged, we trip up, and perhaps then want to give up altogether. Have you had moments in your life where you're just like, you know, Jesus, I'm just going to sit here. I'm done. Or maybe we're like God's people. I love the honesty of, of Scripture. That's one of the reasons we know the Scripture's true is because they didn't hide any of the ugly details. We see all throughout Scripture, we see God's people, we see the disciples at some point saying, can we just go back from whence we came? Can we just go back to Egypt? Yeah, we were slaves there, but, but this is hard. God, we don't understand. We don't fully know where you're leading us yet to when, at least back there, at least in our chaos, at least in our sin and our brokenness, we knew where we were. Am I the only one? We've all had those moments where we think, maybe I'll just go back to where I was before Christ found me. So our big idea this morning as we go through some scripture is this. You can't go back to the starting line, but you can get up and start again from where you are. You can't go back to the starting line. Sometimes we, we start our journey and our, our walk with Christ and things happen in life and we feel discouraged or we feel we're not where we should be or we've gotten off course. And sometimes we think, man, I can't go all the way back to the beginning and start all over. And God's saying, no, I want you to just get up where you are and start following me from there. Just get up from where you are. We can't go back to the starting line, but we can get up and start again from where we are. So our message title is How to Get to Where God is Leading You. One, we start where you are. How do you get to where Christ is leading you? You start where you are. Um, there was a, we lived in Tunisia, North Africa, and there was a saying, a, a thousand steps and not one jump. It's kind of similar to our, our English version of every journey begins with one little step. But this idea of step by step, little bit by little, we follow Christ. It's a journey. We are following him. And just because our life maybe didn't start with a direction and a purpose founded in Christ, doesn't mean we have any further to go than anyone else to get back on the road and the purpose of his leading in our life. So I was, I was raised in a, in a Christian home. I went to church from a small time. I grew up knowing Jesus. Not everyone has had that opportunity. So whether you grew up in church and you made all your mistakes knowing better, maybe you grew up not knowing better and made your mistakes, no matter where you began your walk with Christ, we are all exactly where we need to be to get to where he's leading us. You're never starting behind because when you start with Christ, you're starting right where you need to be to get to where he is leading us. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 through 23 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. So whether you've never walked with Christ before and maybe spent most of your life running as far from him as you could get, or maybe we've followed him and we've gotten off course or, or we're still following him, but we just need that, that strengthening within us to keep continuing on, just know that you are exactly where you need to be when you invite Christ in, when you open that door. The author of Hebrews in chapter 12 gives us some practical advice in following Jesus and getting to where he is leading us in our lives. So I want us to think in this 
As we're starting this new year, to remember, though, that every day is new. And every day, Christ is wanting to lead us into what he has for us. God has beautiful things planned for each and every one of us. And I, I just want to kind of, sometimes we can get uh, too big of an idea in our head. I meet with people a lot of times. And they're like, man, what is my purpose in life? What is God wanting me to do? And we sometimes think there's this big, grand thing that we have to achieve or have a monument built to us. And then, once we've done that, then we fulfilled our purpose in Christ. I'll tell you, our purpose in Christ is fulfilled as we walk day by day, step by step, in obedience to Christ. As we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. See, our purpose is not fulfilled with the completion of a task. Our purpose in this life is fulfilled in and through our everyday relationship in walking with Christ. A life in Christ is a life where the Spirit of God, the infinite creator of the universe, dwells within us and knows us and we know him. In every moment that we choose to listen and walk in obedience to what Jesus has and is calling us to, we are in those moments allowing the presence of God to shape us more and more into the image of Christ and infinitely give opportunity for God to use us in symphony with the good work and purposes he desires for us in the world around us. So how do we get to where Jesus is leading us? How do we follow him? And kids, we've got kids with us. I'm going to need some volunteers here in a little bit. So we have a couple volunteers. Who's, who's brave? I need someone strong and brave and fast. Oliver, okay, perfect. And Amira, perfect. All right, you two will come up and help here in a little bit. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, and the author was first talking about the people of faith before them, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So how do we get to where Jesus is leading us? One, we let go of the sin and the things that are weighing us down and holding us back. So, all right, Oliver and Amira, you guys ready to help? All right, Amira, you want to come up? All right, hurry, hurry, hurry. Okay. Now, Oliver, you look pretty strong. You guys want to come up here? All right. So we're talking about following Jesus and and going on a journey. So when you go on a journey, you go hiking. Do you usually take a backpack? Take stuff? Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's put a backpack on you. All right. There we go. All right. Now, you're pretty strong, right? Hold that. Okay. Now, you're pretty fast, right? Kind of. Okay. Now, imagine if we try, let's say I'm going to take you somewhere. What if I said we're going to go to Culver's, okay? And I'm going to buy us all the ice cream there. Would you, be, would you be willing to walk all the way to Culver's for ice cream? You would? Hey, this man, he's with me. He would. All right. Now, what if I said, though, we just got to carry some weight with us first? All right. So come over here. All right. So we're going to have to carry this here. Turn around. There you go. You ready? Now, you t- let me know. All right. I'm just going to put a few in here. You know what? Maybe we'll just put some more. And we'll put some more. You'd be okay walking all the way to Culver's with this? Okay. Okay, let's try to get some more. All right, if you fall over, we'll, we'll, we we'll won't catch you. All right, you ready? There we go. How's that? Is that is that too much? Tell me when it's too much. How's that? Is that good? That's good. Okay. Well, if that's good, we're gonna add two more. All right, all right. Now, do you think you could? Whoa, you almost fell over. Now, do you think without that backpack, you could run with me to Culver's for ice cream? Do you think with all that you could run? You do. All right. How about now? (laughs) It's a lot more difficult, isn't it? You're going to run. Yeah, you're going to run. Yeah, you're going to run. Why can't you run? No, no, no. It's it's okay. This helps helps you run faster. Oh, no. Okay. Let's go to Culver's. What? Is that going to be too difficult? All right. Well, maybe, maybe then 
the best way to get. So what, what do we need to do if, to make it easier to get to where we're going? Uh, we could, Would it like. Be easier if we got rid of that weight? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we took all that out of there, I'll tell you what, what if I came along and I took all that weight for you? Isn't that a lot better? Yeah, you feel like you can move now? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And Amira, what if you just come along and I took all this off? Why don't we just take a car, she says. There we go. Now, can you move like you're supposed to move now? Yes. Thank you. Give everyone, give our helpers, thank you so much. I owe you guys Culver's now, I guess. All right, kids. So what happened there? So if we're going to take a journey, it's a lot harder to make a journey when you've got all that weight on you, right? So a lot of times the sin and the things in our lives, and sometimes we think in terms of, of like lying and cheating and all the really bad sins, and that's true. That puts weight on us and it holds us back. But sometimes just simply not being obedient to what God's calling us to do holds us back from following him to where he wants us to go. And it's the same as if we, we allow the weight of, of that, of the weight and the burdens of this world and our sin, it weighs us down and it keeps us from getting to where God wants us to go. And where God wants to get us to, what he wants to achieve in our life, as good as Culver's ice cream is, it's way better. Sorry, frozen custard. It's way better. And so the author here is saying, and let us run the endurance, throw off any weight that slows us down. Especially that sin so easily trips us up. It wraps around us. And, and that's what disobedience to God does. It wraps us up and it keeps us from doing what we have been called and designed to do in following him. So let go of the sin that's letting, weighing us down and holding us back. Sin weighs us down. It robs us of energy. It robs us of time. It robs us of money. How I many of you know sin can be fun but expensive? It robs us of relationships. Sin strips and knocks us down as we try to follow Jesus, hurting ourselves and sometimes others. So how do we avoid tripping and, and following? How? There's a lot of things that in this world can catch our attention, that can get us distracted. There's a lot of weight. There's a lot of things in this world that as we travel following Christ, we want to pick up and, and take with us and put in our life's backpack, and, and it slows us down. How do we travel on without accumulating? How do we let go of the things that have stuck to us? The author goes on to say, verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We keep our eyes on Christ because he's the one who takes the weight off of us. He's the one who unwraps the things that have ensnared and are holding us back from fulfilling all that he has for us. They go on to say, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Only glance at your struggle and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. We have struggles. There's going to be struggles in life. There's going to be things that are going to tempt us. There's going to be problems and just difficulties in life. It's not always just sin, but just difficulties in life that we're not going to want to trust Jesus with, that we want to try to figure it out on our own. And the way we keep following Christ, the way we get to where we need to be with him, the way we allow him to lead us out of the things that we're trying to get out of is we've got to stop looking at those things and put our eyes on Christ. Only glance at your problem, gaze at Jesus. But too often times what happens is we glance at Jesus, you see my problem, and then we stare at the problem. The problem isn't going to fix itself. We put our eyes on Christ who is the one who redeems and saves and leads us. A good example I learned the hard way, first day having my motorcycle, uh, there's this thing called target fixation. And it's the idea of you're going through a turn on your motorcycle, and the reality is wherever your head and eyes go, the motorcycle will go. And if you've ridden a bike, you may not realize it, but the same thing happens. If you ever tried to miss something and you just 
the bike, your bicycle or motorcycle doesn't want to turn and you hit that thing, it's because your body naturally steers you into what you are looking at. And there was a first day I was out and there was this big turn and there was all this gravel in the middle of this 90 degree turn. And so my brain's like, that's a problem. That's a danger. And so I'm fixated, not realizing because I'm new, I'm fixated on the problem. And I'm like, why won't the motorcycle turn? And so I had to get on my brakes and slide off the road and I was fine. But the problem was I was fixated on the problem. But if I lifted my eyes up and looked to where I needed to be, that's where I would have gone. And so the same principle is we put our eyes on Christ. We look to him. We look at God, Christ in his word. We see how Jesus responds. We see his words giving us life and giving us wisdom. We spend time in, in prayer and just letting the Holy Spirit fill us and give us wisdom that we don't have. Allowing the voice of God to speak through other people. We come together and we, we share our burdens with one another. And we go to those who are wiser and we say, you know, how would Jesus maybe be leading me through this? And we get our eyes on him. So don't get distracted. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let us not let the non-important things of life have the driver's seat in our life. Another way we need to be following Jesus is we have to be so careful what we prioritize in our life. The, what we prioritize our time for in life is what is going to steer the direction of our life. Whatever we prioritize the most in our life, that is going to steer the direction of our life. If we prioritize Christ first and foremost in our life, that is going to be the direction our life is going. If Jesus, Jesus isn't in that seat if we aren't prioritizing our relationship and walk with him, then every single time we are going to drift away from where God is wanting to lead us. Every single time we are going to steer away from the blessings God has for us and down dead-end roads that lead us away from the best that God has for us. So here's a word of encouragement. Parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, spiritual parents, your kids and grandkids, those that, are, that you are influencers of, are watching what is most important in your life. If you are a follower of Christ, the world is watching what is most important in your life. What we prioritize and the direction we allow our spiritual lives to be steered by will often become the priorities and direction our children and their children's children will continue to allow to steer the direction of their lives. They go on, verse 3. Think of all the hostility he endured, talking about Jesus, from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. What they're saying is think about everything Jesus suffered and endured for us. He already died for our sins so that we don't have to live in them. Jesus died for our sins so we don't have to live in them. The author goes on to encourage us that when we as God's children wander off from where he is leading us, that God in his love will correct, discipline, and teach us. You see that word in the Bible says, God disciplines those he loves. How many of you love that verse? Kids, are you listening? Because God loves us, when we wander from where we need to be, he will discipline us. And I think the problem is, in this life, sometimes we don't always get a healthy picture of what discipline is. Sometimes we think of discipline as just punishment. Discipline is not punishment. Discipline is teaching and correcting. And that is done out of love, not out of anger or hate. If we steer ourselves into a pothole of sin in life, God is going to let us feel the bumps. Sometimes part of God's grace and part of his discipline is he allows us to experience the roughness of our decisions so that we realize that's not good. And he teaches us so we can come back to him. 
when our sin is causing us problems, we need to stop just asking God to get us out of our consequences and start looking for his leading and teaching on how to get out of our sins and consequences or out of our sins that lead to those consequences and problems. There's moments in our lives where we're following and just we may feel off and just things aren't going right. And it's in those moments I would encourage just to stop and say, okay, God, am I being disciplined? Or am I just experiencing a rough time? Just sit with him and let God lead us and direct us because that word discipline comes from disciple, student, teaching. And so discipline doesn't mean God's hurting us. It doesn't always mean he's allowing, but there's just something he's trying to teach us. And how you know the hardest moments in school that you had you were learning some of the biggest lessons. Some of the hardest moments in life, we learned the biggest lessons. And so when we're struggling in life, when we're struggling with following Christ, it's a good time to stop and say, okay, God, what are you wanting me to learn right now? What are you correcting? What are you wanting to lead me into? What are you wanting to lead me out of? And we'll just, wrapping up here, the author goes on to say, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children. He said, and this is to be an encouragement, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Verse 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you're not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? Because the correction, the discipline of Christ, of God, the Holy Spirit within us leads us to life. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful, but afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Verse 12. So take a new grip. And I love how he comes back to this. So we've been walking through life. Maybe you've gotten off kilter and, and God's trying to correct us. And sometimes that, that pain, that discipline, that's what lets us know we've gotten off course from following Christ. Sometimes he's calling out and saying, hey, child, come back to me. No, I'm not giving you what you're asking for until you get right with me because you're just going to wander farther and farther away. And so we may have that moment, we turn to him, we look to him. And so the author says here, so take a new grip with your tired hands. I mean, taking a grip, a hold of your faith in Christ. And strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. There's this call, this admonishment to say, I am in this moment going to follow Christ and get back in step with him. In closing, we see the words, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31. The reality is we can't strengthen ourselves, can we? But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The Spirit of God gives us the strength we need to follow him. We don't follow him in our own strength, in our own wisdom. We follow Jesus through his strength, through his wisdom, because he's the one who lifts off those burdens. He's the one who takes off those backpacks, unwraps those things that have instilled tangled us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Part of that is putting our eyes on him. What are we trusting? Are we trusting him fully? Whatever we trust the most, that is what we are going to look to. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. So as we do this, look at this theme of following Christ and continuing on, I just got kind of brought to remembrance the kind of as a closing blessing here. If you'd stand with me. This is from uh, St. Patrick's uh, breastplate prayer. It's just this beautiful uh, picture of focusing our eyes on Christ. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me. God's might to uphold me. God's wisdom to guide me. God's eye to look before me. God's ear to hear me. God's word to speak for me. God's hand to guard me. God's shield to protect me. God's host to save me. From snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill, afar and near. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me.